Greetings to all of you who are here today on this Sabbath and to those who will be able to listen and view this tape later on. We are very pleased to be able to bring to you the message from the Eternal as we do strive as ministers to serve God and to have on our mind what God is thinking, to be as close to God as possible. We strive to do that as ministers. And we know the time is running out, the time is short as this nation continues to flounder, not knowing which way is up, so to speak, and will continue to sink into some type of moral abyss that we have not seen yet and come to a screeching halt as the days go by. The economy is on the rocks as a ship would be, sinking, and we will suffer severely because of our economic basis our trust in the dollar, our trust in our friends, our lovers that will turn against us and we will be left high and dry, so to speak, as a nation and we will continue to suffer. But that is not the message of the sermon today. The message of the sermon is one that I felt was very, very needful at this time. As we are on the verge of Pentecost, the day when God established the New Testament church poured out his spirit upon the apostles and the 120 that were assembled there in that upper room, as well as in ancient history the outpouring of his law upon a nation that was simply cut off from God as they lived their land lives in the land of Egypt. We're here today because of our forefathers. We're here today because of what God has done. We're here today because he has built a church. And he has seen fit to not allow the gates of hell to prevail against it. And we're here to serve the eternal. And we're here to devote our lives to the Almighty. Yes, let's change pace here once again and ask the question, as we all probably have some sort of a garden, how's it growing? How's it growing? I remember last year we thought, well, we might have a very good garden. But about this time, it turned dry. It stayed dry. I'm not sure I saw a drop of water until sometime in the fall. Very dry. In fact, on the way to the feast, the Shenandoah Valley was so dry that pastures were brown. Everything was very, very destitute. Yet on the way back from the feast, things had sparked to life once again because rain has come. How does one garden grow? How does it grow? Have we ever thought about the little simple project of putting a seed in the ground? We have little packets of seeds, onion <clears throat> sets maybe from time to time. We may have potato sets that we put in the ground. Things that produce a new crop. But seeds, let's speak, speak about seeds. The spark of life that's in a little nugget that allows a new plant to grow. I was admiring the new beans that are coming up in our garden. Maybe I hadn't really noticed before. I'd always thought about corn, and corn when it sprouts, the roots come out of the one side of the corn kernel and it goes down and, and then the new stem comes up out of the corn kernel but it stays in the ground. But I was looking at the, the beans the other day and I was amazed that it actually had pushed the outer part of the bean up with the plant and it would fall off and there would be the new leaves coming out of what was once the seed. Amazing. Yet God designed it all. Every plant has a different beginning, so to speak. And it's amazing that God could think of all this. And yet, when you put in a bean seed, you get a bean. When you put in a corn, you get corn. There's no such thing as mixing and coming up with some new variety. It just doesn't happen that way. Not cross-germination between different seeds. Yes, if it's a poppy seed, if it's a geranium, if it's um, 
corn, we can, we can create a different corn crop, that's right, but not jumping from one seed to another seed of a different variety. It doesn't happen. But all of life that the plant needs begins within that seed, in that germ, in that nugget. And so we love to see the seeds grow. We love to see them germinate and sprout and have a new plant, a new life, a new beginning. But in the process of having new life, what we put in the ground has to die. If it doesn't die, there is no new growth. There is no crop. There is no harvest. And so we could understand the lesson that in order to have life, it has to come from a life giver. God doesn't die, but he's creating a family. But he started with human beings that have the potential to die. Most will. Only a few might be left to, to be alive to change when the return of Jesus Christ comes, but it is still a death. But he wants us to learn, as we look at our gardens and see how they grow, that we need to be giving, giving of ourselves. That little seed gave of itself. It gave everything it had to produce a new crop. Seeds, gardens, they all take work. If it doesn't rain, there's no crop. No sunshine, no crop. But that's the way life is. God designed it that way, that there would be sunshine, there would be rain. He says, as long as this earth exists in the condition that it's in, there'll be springtime, fall, winter, summer, planting, and harvest. It's a promise from God. So I ask, yes, how's our physical garden growing? Hopefully we can see the future. We can wait patiently for the crops that will come in this fall. We'll be able to dig the potatoes and harvest the ears of corn and have beans to can. And yes, I've enjoyed the strawberries we've been picking already. And the cherries are on the tree and the pears and the peaches. But all it takes is a hailstorm, a hurricane, a tornado. Crops can be destroyed. So I asked, what about us? What about our garden? What's planted in our garden? Spiritual garden, what's planted? God's given to us what? His spirit. That spirit is to produce a lot of fruit. And one of those fruits is faith. So I want to talk about our garden of faith. Seeds of faith must not be planted in parched and rocky soil of fear and doubt. The seeds of faith must not be planted in a parched and rocky soil of fear and doubt. Yet we take the lessons of ancient Israel we look at what they had to endure when they came out of Egypt. They was leaving everything behind that they had known. They was traveling unto an unknown world, to a promise that somehow had never materialized for them. One generation after another had died. Even Joseph was buried in Egypt. Yet he said, please don't leave me here. Take me back to the promised land. Do we live in a garden of fear and doubt? Or has the rains come and the soil been watered and fertilized so that our seeds of faith can grow? It's questions we need to ask. Water, precious water. Anytime we fast and go without 
water for a period of time. Oh, how sweet it tastes. Gardens need water. Those seeds need water. Those plants need water. Crops need water. And you and I need spiritual water. And that's the word of God. Seeds that must grow. God didn't give us his spirit to lie dormant, just like seeds in a package that can lie dormant for several years, even though there's an expiration date. If they're planted in enough time, within the right amount of time, they will germinate. God's placed within us his spirit. And with that spirit, he wants us to produce faith. Produce faith. For we live in a society, in a world that's afraid. Do we not? What are we afraid of? Well, now we're afraid that gas prices will increase to where we won't be able to travel anywhere. We can't go see and and Uncle Harry and Aunt Sally. Can't see them. Can't go this place. Can't go that. Can't. We're going to have to tighten our belts. We can't go to the movies as often. We can't eat out. We're afraid that we won't have a job tomorrow. We're afraid that our retirement funds won't be enough. We're afraid that we might get sick and die. We're afraid of life itself. Couldn't we be living in the 20s and the 30s? Could we be living in another time, another place, if we won't have so much to be afraid of? Education, what good is it? I can't find a job when I graduate from college. A lot of people are afraid. Afraid of the neighbors. Afraid of the crime and statistics that happen in the cities, the gangs. And, the, and then we're afraid of war. Sending our young children off to war. Afraid. Maybe there isn't life after death. Afraid. Afraid. Afraid of our own shadow. Afraid to go out at night. Afraid to go out at day. Afraid to walk in a park. Afraid to take a ride, a bicycle ride on a path. Afraid of being killed, afraid of being raped, afraid of being molested, afraid, afraid, afraid. We live in a world that's fear, filled with fear. And how does it affect you and me? As members of God's church, how does it affect us? Are we afraid? Are we filled with doubt? God can't hear my prayers. I'm too much of a sinner. God won't listen to me. I'm too much of a hypocrite. God won't listen to me because I'm too evil. Oh, I know God promised, but I haven't seen any reward. I know God says, I'll lift you up. But all I find, I'm still down. Why am I so depressed? Why am I so discouraged? Why am I so this or that? Why am I going through this valley of the shadow of death? Why? Didn't God promise a different road for me to travel? <coughs> Faith like any other aspect of God's spirit, must be rooted in good soil. It must be planted where it can grow. It must be allowed to grow. It must be well watered, intended to, and cared for. Yes. And that's why the church that's why God established the church. To bring people together of like mind, filled with his spirit, to be watered by the washing of his word. 
But so many people have said, well, we don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to assemble ourselves together. I can listen to a DVD. I could do this. I could do that. I don't need God like I used to. And besides, where was God when I really did need him? He wasn't there, was he? The children of Israel came out of Egypt. What were they afraid of? As soon as God put them in a box canyon, right? Mountains on one side, mountains on another, the sea on one side, and the Egyptians, the Egyptian army on the other, boxed in. What was the human reaction but fear? And then doubt. Wasn't there enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to slay us? But we live in a society that's filled with that. It permeates it. And so people got tired of a church that wasn't producing any fruit. Got tired of a church that was hypocritical. Got tired of this or that. And turned their back on everything. And so they throw the baby out with the bathwater. But faith. What did the children of Israel need when they came out of Egypt? They needed faith. They needed faith. How was they supposed to have faith? Why did some people, like Joshua and Caleb, have faith, and so many others did not? Yes, God didn't give his spirit to all of those people. But to the few that he gave his spirit, they began to develop faith, to be able to walk with God through the times of fear and the times of doubt. But most of the people saw the physical and was afraid. Yet Jesus Christ was with them. The rock was with them. The rock that we need, that we are to build our house on today, was with them. It was a cloud by day, a fire by night, brought water out of solid rock to water them, gave them manna every day, six days a week, but they lacked faith. They could not believe from this day to the next day, no matter how many miracles were performed. They could not trust in God, that God would see them to the promised land. It got to a point that when they come up to take the promised land, they were afraid once again of the people that were supposed to be giants, not knowing that God can slay all the giants that come our way. David, was a shepherd's boy. He took care of sheep, his father's herd, his father's flock. He's a young lad. What was he afraid of? A little boy, maybe a teenager, out taking care of sheep. He was not afraid. He was not afraid. Because what John says, perfect love casts out fear. David had a love for his father's sheep that superseded anything that came into his path. The love for his sheep overrode any fear. His life was to be laid down for the sheep. And that's what David did. So when he was talking to King Saul about Goliath, 
a man who's defying the living armies of God, he says, well, I was able to kill a bear and a lion. Why? Because of love. God's given to us his word and washes us, that water, gives us the water we need to drink because he loves us. And that allows our faith to grow. So David slew Goliath. Was not afraid of his stature, his weaponry, his armor. Was not afraid of that at all. But are you and I afraid? Afraid that we might not have a job tomorrow? Afraid that God can't provide finances for us? Provide a home for us to live in? What did he say to do? Seek the kingdom of God first, and all these other things will be added unto you. And as we approach Pentecost, our minds should be zeroed in on the fact that God has given to us the most precious gift that he could give us, and that is his spirit, the power of Almighty God, that we should be able to walk with God and talk with God and know that we're with God, and we can see God, not with our physical eyes, but with our spiritual eyes, and that the, root, the seed of faith is growing deep within us. I want to turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. We all know that faith starts small. God always starts small. He started with just Adam and then he made Eve. He said, be fruitful and multiply. He started with a small group of men, 12 men. Had 120 on that first day of Pentecost in 31 A.D. He started with Abraham, the father of the faithful. Abraham, who was asked to do the unthinkable. Asked to go slay the very son of promise. Lay him out on an altar and cut his throat and let the blood run. Build a fire under him and have him for a burnt offering. Was Abraham filled with doubt? Was Abraham filled with fear? He told the servants, we shall return. Was Abraham lying? No. He knew that this was the son of promise, that there was nothing that God could ask of Abraham to do that would negate that promise. Even if it took the life of Isaac, it meant there had to be a resurrection. And Jesus Christ says, I am the resurrection and the life. Yes, faith starts small. It will increase. It must increase so that it completely fills our life. We, we speak of Stephen, a man full of faith. Barnabas, a man full of faith. And Stephen was able to lay down his life and die as a martyr. Start small. Mustard seed. Isn't that what Jesus Christ said? Well, shoot, if I just had faith of a mustard seed, and that's the tiniest of all the herbs, I can move mountains. Yes, but if that mustard seed's not planted, it won't grow, will it? It won't become the, the greatest of all the herbs so the birds can roost in it. No, it will not produce unless it's planted. So people run around and say, well, I just wish I had the faith of a mustard seed. I guess I don't, because I can't move mountains, and I can't say this or that or whatever. But it must be sown so that it grows. The potential's there. Like all seeds, the potential's there. But it must grow. 
Luke chapter 17, verse 5. The title of the sermon, Increase Our Faith. The apostle said to Jesus Christ, Increase our faith. Christ was asking them to do what they thought was impossible. If your brother sins against you, you rebuke him. If he asks for your forgiveness, you forgive him. And how many times, Peter said? Oh, just seven times, right? Christ said, no, 70 times seven. Oh, no. See, this is going into people's minds that have been trained and geared in a society that says, I need revenge. I need to take matters into my own hands. I, we need to throw off the Roman Empire. We need to be, what? Like the scribes and the Pharisees, right? What kind of lives were they living? They were afraid of the Romans. Romans had the authority to kill them, to wipe them off the map. If your brother sins against you, forgive him. As many times as he asked for that forgiveness. That goes against human nature. Someone does me wrong, as the song says, what do we do? We want to right that wrong. We want to get even. We want to strike back. We want to seek justice for ourselves. So the apostle says, how do you do it? How do you do it, Master? How do you do it? How can you do, live in this society that's against you every which way you turn? If they're not taxing you to death, they're, they're stealing from you blind, blindly. You, they're just, this society is evil. How do, how do you, the Son of God, live in this society? So please, Increase our faith. And so Jesus Christ said, verse 6, if you had the faith as a mustard seed, if God has given to you and me his Holy Spirit, then we have faith. Starts as a mustard seed. It must not stay a mustard seed. Saul safely wrapped up in a neat package sitting on the shelf that we just bought, bought from uh, Henry Fields. No, no. Or Burpees or some other seed catalog. No. No, that seed must come out of that package. God's given to us his spirit, placed it within us, and it comes with the potential of producing fruit. And one of those fruits is taking that mustard seed of faith and allowing it to grow and expand to where we walk and talk with God as if we were seeing him face to face. Not needing miracles to believe in God because the demons believe and tremble. But believing that we have the potential to be in his family, to be in his kingdom, to be able to walk and talk with him today and then forever. Take that mustard seed and plant it. And then we can say to the mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Or for the mountains to depart. Or for fig trees to dry up. Christ did all that when he came to a fig tree that was not producing any fruit. What are we afraid? Do we doubt? See, with God's spirit, we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't doubt. We should be filled with faith. How many years have we been in the church? Has faith grown? Has faith increased? The disciples said, Master, increase our faith. They didn't say, give us faith. Give us some faith. They said, no, increase our faith. We've got a little bit of faith here. 
We know you're the Son of God. Peter said that. Who else are we going to turn to? You are the Son of the living God. We know that. Increase our faith. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. The example of a man having a very sick child in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 17 that, that he had brought to the disciples and they couldn't heal the boy. They couldn't do anything for him. What's Jesus' response? Verse 17 of chapter 17 of Matthew, Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. There, he, he was living in a generation that truly did not obey God. Lip service. How many rules and regulations were there about the Sabbath? The holy day. What you could or not do. It was, it was a society that was totally wrong. Oh yes, Jesus Christ said that the Pharisees sat in Moses' seat and what do they bid you to do? You do. But you don't do as they do because they're hypocrites. And he's bringing what? Twelve men. He's working with twelve men for three and a half years to train them. Hey, they don't have his spirit yet. They don't have the Holy Spirit yet. They're being trained. How long must I be with you? How long was God with the children of Israel? For 40 years they wandered in the wilderness because they lacked faith. They were a faithless and perverse generation. Steeped in the idolatry and ideology of Egypt. And God never got Egypt out of Israel. They were not willing. With Egypt comes fear and doubt. It's part of what God's plan of salvation is all about as we think about the days of unleavened bread. Coming out of sin, coming out of Egypt, coming out of a way of life that is contrary to God, that is anti-God, that doesn't even begin to think like God. What if Abraham stayed in the land of his nativity? God would have had to call somebody else. By faith, Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans. He left the Mesopotamian Valley. He left to go to some place he never knew existed. And when he got there, he was in a constant battle over water rights, pasture rights. And God says, it's yours. And he, did, did Abraham doubt God? No, no. He was willing to deal with the here and now seeing something in the future, yet in dealing with the here and now, he was learning to do it God's way. To walk by faith and not by sight. All of God's servants must learn that. To be in the kingdom of God, we must have faith. Why? Because it's impossible to please God if we don't have faith. So here he says, oh faithless and perverse generation. Of course, Christ healed the child and then the disciples come to Jesus Christ privately. When it's all over, it's now time to go to school. 
It's now time to come talk to the master and say, okay, what, what's, what's going on here? Remember, you sent us out two by two. You gave us the power to heal the sick, cast out demons. Now, what's, what's going on here? What, 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 what's going on here? We need to know. Why could we not cast him out? Verse 19. Very simple question. What's going on? We did. We asked. We did everything that you taught us to do. And what does Jesus Christ say? Because of your unbelief. My margin says little faith. They had faith. They didn't have enough faith. It would take time to develop extra faith. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Now hold it, wait a minute. If the mustard seed is the smallest herb, and it's a tiny, tiny seed, the disciples have faith. They said before, other places, increase our faith. They have faith. They have a little faith. Is their faith smaller than this mustard seed now? Mustard seed's very, very tiny. They have a little faith. They have a tiny faith. They have faith as a seed of mustard. But it's not growing yet. They need God's spirit to allow it to grow and to increase. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. But they just couldn't even, they couldn't cast out the demon. They had faith, but not enough faith. Why? Because of doubt. Something was different in this situation. They weren't able to do it. Say to the mountain, move from here, go over there, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now I talked about the garden being watered by God's word. What's needed here? What did Jesus Christ say? This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. See? Seeds got to go through what? That plant has to go through some trials, does it not? Maybe a little bit of wind. Maybe a little bit of dry conditions. Maybe. You know grapes do best when it's dry? Not every crop needs bushels and bushels of water, so to speak. There are times that plants need not water. They need some hot sun. What makes corn grow? hot summer nights. What makes you and us grow is trials and difficulties and going through those valleys of the shadow of death. Yes, ask to kill your son. Ask to do this. Ask to lay down your life. Ask and ask. But how do we get through that? What the disciples lacked was what Jesus Christ had been doing when he would leave them and go up in the mountain and pray all night. The times he spent in fasting, not just the 40 days and 40 nights. But people still think, well, I must not have much faith. Because if I had faith like this little tiny seed of mustard, I could move mountains. No mountains are moved because the tiny seed of mustard has been planted, it has been growing, it has been enduring, it has been learning, it is being educated, it is being tried by tests by fire, as God says, and without many persecutions and trials and tribulations, we don't enter into the kingdom of God. It is because of all that that we are then able to have a relationship with God that when we need to move a mountain, it moves. It may not be a physical mountain. It may, may be a spiritual mountain, a spiritual problem. And that mountain parts, just like the Red Sea parted for the children of Israel. It was by faith. 
What did Moses do? He simply raised his rod, which is what God told him to do. These men and women of old didn't do the impossible. They did what they were asked to do. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Verse 23 is the time when Jesus Christ gets into a boat. It's not a rowboat. <laughs> Sometimes I think we get a wrong picture of what kind of boat this is. This is a seafaring boat. This is one that's able to go across the Sea of Galilee. It's not some little dinky flat bottom boat that you might go fishing down some little r lake once in a while. No, this is a boat that's meant to travel across the waves of the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee is no small lake. And, of course, it is subjected to a lot of windstorms, a lot of tempests, and these are fishermen. His disciples follow him, right? Peter and James and John and Andrew are fishermen. They know the sea. They're not afraid of the sea, are they? Not if you're fishermen. How many fishermen, seafaring men, are afraid? Yes, I think there is some that are afraid. That's right. You get out there, out in the middle of the ocean, and there's nothing but water. It's always good to be able to place your feet on the terra firma, as they say, the good solid ground. But there are those who are Seafaring men, they, they don't mind it. They, they face the wind and the storms, and they go through it. A good sea captain knows the sea, and he's able to steer the ship through it. Well, Jesus Christ is tired. He's a physical human being. He needs to sleep. He can't go 24-7, 365 days a year, without sleep. He needs sleep because he's physical. Yes, he is in touch with Jesus, I mean with God, and as God in the flesh, he's able to do tremendous miracles and he can stand a lot more than the most human beings. Well, he goes down and he goes to sleep. And a storm comes up. Now, we're disciples, and we're in this boat with Jesus Christ, and the storm comes. And this is not just dumb, ordinary storm. This is getting ferocious. It's getting increasing, getting rougher. What would you and I do? We know we're about to sink. Jesus Christ is down there asleep. How he can sleep through all this is because he's not afraid. He's in the hands of whom? He's in the hands of his father. The boat could sink, right? And Jesus Christ would drown, right? No, of course not. Would the disciples drown? Of course not. Did Abraham kill Isaac? Of course not. These were hand-picked men that God picked after Jesus Christ prayed all night. Was God going to allow any of these men to perish before their time? No. But they're afraid. God's with them, and they're afraid. He's right there, and they're afraid. That's what was wrong with the children of Israel. God was right with them, and they were still afraid. Is God with us, and we're still afraid? Sadly, I'm going to say yes. So they're afraid. They, they, they wake him up and say, Lord, save us. We're perishing. And what does he say? Well, yeah, you, I, I guess so. I, I didn't realize I'm up to my waist in water here. This boat's about ready to go under. I better do something. No, he didn't say that. He said to them, why are you afraid? Oh, you? 
of no faith. No, he didn't say they didn't have any faith. He said of little faith. He arose and rebuked the wind and the sea. Okay, he, God has the power over everything that he's created, including you and me, everything. And there was a great calm. Oh, yes. It went from, what would you say, a Category 5 of any type of storm that we have, whether it be a tornado or a hurricane, down to perfect calmness. You could walk across that water. Not a ripple in it. And the men marvel, saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Faith. Jesus Christ knew who he was. He was in the hands of his Father. He came to do the Father's will. That's all they needed was to have faith. The boat could have sunk from underneath them, and they could have walked to shore. They didn't need a boat to get to the other side. Jesus Christ proved that once. He came walking on the water. Peter stepped out and walked on water. What do you and I need when the storms come and the boat's sinking out from under us? If God is for us, who can be against us? And yet, we lack the faith to step out with God totally in all aspects of our lives. All aspects of our lives. Many times the disciples doubted even Thomas. After all what Jesus Christ had went through and was killed and was resurrected, Thomas says, I won't believe. I won't believe. I don't care how many people stand up here and tell me he's risen, that he's alive, yet he was told the same thing that all the other disciples was told. I will destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days. The prophecies all predicted it. He says, I will not believe. He doubted. What was there to doubt? What did he have? He had, didn't have the faith. But when he stuck his hands in the gash in the side of Jesus Christ and saw the nail prints in his hands, he buckled. He buckled. He fell on his knees. And Jesus Christ said, okay, you, you believe now. Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. But the demons believe, the devil believes, that God is who he is, that he is the creator, the awesome living being that has made you and me to be born into his family. If we allow his spirit to develop the faith in us that will see us through the difficult times yet ahead. As they say, we haven't seen anything yet. What the disciples needed to do in that boat was look to God. Put their lives in the hands of God. Allow the boat to sink. If Jesus Christ could sleep through the storm, so could they. Be calm. Be rested assurance. Blessed assurance that God is for us. We think of Ruth leaving Moab. We know from what God has told us that 
Those that were in Moab had no inheritance with the children of Israel. None. Moab was a nation that was not to mix with Israel, period. Ever. How much of that Ruth knew, I don't know. But she says, Naomi, where you go, I'm going. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your country will be my country. Your God will be my God. There is no greater affirmation of someone who's being converted than Ruth when she said that. There is nothing in Israel for her. No future, no home, no family. She was going because she loved her mother-in-law. Period. She didn't have any fears, no doubts. Her eyes were fixed on her mother-in-law. Where she was going, Ruth was going. Where Naomi was going to lie down and sleep, she was going to do it. And whatever Naomi believed in, Ruth was going to believe in. Because Ruth loved Naomi. God wants us to love him unconditionally. Without any holds barred. Unconditionally. Where God goes, we go. If he takes us into a valley of the shadow of death, and death is the outcome, he's still in charge. If he takes the roof off the house, he's still in charge. If the finances simply vanish, he's still in charge. And he knows what you and I need every single day of our life. Ruth pictures the church with unconditional love. Boaz pictures Jesus Christ with unconditional love. Can we reach that goal? Do we have the faith to believe God with every promise that he has given to us? That there's no conditions, no strings attached, no nothing attached except obedience because he gives his spirit to those who obey him. There's a lot to this topic, so much. I was sitting at the table with my wife this past week thinking about all that God has done from the Old Testament to the New Testament, men and women of faith, and how they trusted in God when everything else was screaming around them, you're wrong. Even Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. Even if he slays me, he's still my Redeemer. Sometimes I think we place too much value on this human life and not enough value on the spiritual life that God has given to us. We are physical. We take everything in through our five senses. But God wants us to take everything in through his spirit. And then look at the five senses from a different perspective. But that takes faith. Faith must grow. It must develop. It must increase. So Job sits there on a pile of ashes. And he's accused of everything under the sun, so to speak, of how much of a sinner he truly is. And yet, he wants an audience with God. He wants to see God face to face. He wants to talk to God. He says, God, it will 
God will avenge me. He will set the record straight. He will straighten me, straighten everybody else out. Job didn't think he needed straightened out. Not yet. Not until God got through with him. And then he realized just who he was. And that's where humility comes into play. Job had to humble himself. Ruth had to humble herself. Abraham had to humble himself. Joshua and Caleb had to humble themselves. Moses had to humble himself. Rahab had to humble herself. In order to have the faith to walk with God for the rest of their life. We can turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When's he going to give us the reward? Oh, yes, we want it now, not tomorrow. Lord, give me patience, and I need it now, not tomorrow. Lord, I need faith, I need it now, not tomorrow. Well, God's given us a lot of tomorrows, has he not? Every, new, every day is a new beginning. The sun comes up as the earth rolls, and it's a new day, a new beginning. Are we going to be closer to God or further away from God? Are we going to be faithful to God or, or unfaithful to God? Are we going to allow our faith to increase, or or circumstances going to decrease our faith in God? We're going to be see fear and doubt instead of faith and hope and trust in God. It talks about all these men and women of what they did in serving God. I want to drop down beginning here in verse 31 to break into here. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. That's all she did. She was hospitable. She brought them in. She knew who they were and hid them. Of course, she asked a favor of them. She asked, when you come, Spare me. The spy says, okay, we will. We ha you hang this red rope that uh, we're going to go down out of this window in. You let it be hanging out the window. Now, what's God thinking about all this? What's God thinking about all this? Here's, here's human beings making an agreement. Rahab's placing her lives that is her, her and her family. Everybody's going to be in that household. Their lives are in the lives of the two spies. Spies don't know that the walls are going to come crashing down, do they? They don't know that yet. They figured, well, they're just going to march in the gates and we won't attack that house because the cord's hanging out the window. Now, what's God thinking? Do you not have faith that we can move mountains? That we can actually move God to do something different? The walls fell down. God had to hold a section up. But that's not impossible with God, is it? He looked at that relationship. What Rahab did And it's here in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. It says, by faith. How much faith did Rahab have? 
Here's what she had. She knew that the Red Sea had parted many, many, many years before. If she wasn't alive at the time, she heard it when she was a child. The Israelites are coming. It's just they got detained for 40 years because of a lack of faith. What's Rahab got? When the children of Israel show up on the doorstep, she's got faith. They don't have any faith. She's got faith. They're not mentioned here. Which one of the children of Israel is mentioned here? No, we know Joshua and Caleb because they did not die in that 40 years. We know Moses had faith, but he was not allowed to enter into the promised land. Here's Joshua and Caleb coming in with the children of Israel and who has faith. What did Jesus Christ say? To the centurion. The centurion simply said, I need my son healed. I need my servant healed. I need someone healed, okay? You go to God, you need somebody healed. What, what's the centurion say? You're not, I'm not worthy to have you come in my door. I'm not worthy for you to set foot in my door, in my house. All you have to do is say the word. And it's done. And Jesus Christ says, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in all of Israel. And who's Israel? The Testament church. The Old Testament church. That's whom Jesus Christ came to. It was the, it was the church in the wilderness. It was, it, was, it, was, it was fading away, as the Apostle Paul said. That, that's always going away. And Jesus Christ was going to build a new church. The two loaves that we'll discuss tomorrow, the way sheep offer. Two loaves, no greater faith. Who has the faith when the children of Israel show up at the doorstep? A harlot, a sinner. She's got the faith. She didn't perish with those who did not believe when she'd received the spies with peace. God looked at what Rahab did, honored her contract with the spies. Because she knew. She knew that in order to spare her life physically, she had to make some type of peace agreement with the Israelites. She knew that. But more importantly, she knew that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. If he could part the Red Sea, and if he just a few weeks before parted the Jordan Sea, and if he brought all these people through the wilderness, and they're going to inherit this land, then God is who he says he is. That's the God I want to serve. It's what Ruth said. It's what Rahab said. It's what all the men and women of God have said. And so it drops down, verse 32, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. They did all that. Women received their dead, raised to life again. There were those who went through the valley of the shadow of death and come out on the side still living. But that was not the life that they were looking forward to. They all knew that there was another country coming, another city, another, another place to live that God was building and making. And so it says... And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. We don't know when tomorrow may not come. Something, some terrible tragedy could affect us and we wouldn't be living anymore in this physical realm. This 
this little seed that God's given to us, human life, that the Apostle Paul says it must be buried in the ground to await the resurrection, a new life. Still others had trials, mockings, and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sold in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Suffered terribly for the truth that they had, for observing and obeying God's law. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith. So it's not a question of whether we live or die physically. It's not a question of whether I'm wealthy today and poor tomorrow. It's not a question of anything physical. It's a question of what's growing in me and you spiritually. Has that seed of faith been growing? All these have obtained a good testimony through faith, not, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What a glorious opportunity we have to be just like these men and women of old and to walk with God as never before, a church moved by faith, not by sight. Moved because it has developed those seeds of faith, growing and growing and growing. Because we're doing it. Because God loves us, and we love him, and we will see him as he is. Don't let doubt and fear, that old parched and rocky soil, be a part of us. But let us be that tree that's planted by the riverside, which won't see the drought in times of a lack of rain. God's always giving to us rain. The showers of blessings are always flowing. He knows what we need, and he will give it to us. All we need to do is ask in faith, trusting and believing. And we will have what's most important, a new birth, to be born into the family of God. Yes, let's ask our maker that it would please increase our faith. Thank mm -hmm. you.